So today I'm going to solve 100% of your equity problems with, with a model called slicing pi. And slicing pi is a universal, one-size-fits-all solution for the allocation and recovery of equity in an early-stage bootstrap startup company. Early-stage bootstrap startup company. It is a universal model. I mean, the model I'm going to talk about today is a one-size-fits-all model. It will work exactly the way it's supposed to out of the box. What's the most common thing you hear when you hear of traditional equity splits? What does your lawyer and advisors always tell you about equity splits? What's the word they use? It depends. You ever hear that one? It depends on this, and depends on that, and depends on This depends on nothing. It depends on following the rules, and that's all it is. And I want to let you know that Slicey Pie is a real thing. It's available all over the world. It's books been translated into a number of different languages. It's not a theory. It's not a concept that hasn't been applied. It's been used all over the world today. I developed the model in 2010 and published the first white paper on it. And in all that time, I haven't heard of a single founder dispute. So founder disputes are extremely common in startup companies. Because we'll go in 50-50 and you'll do all the work and I do nothing and I own half your company. Very typical. In fact, 66% of companies that fail, fail because of founder disputes. So slicing pie is a way to dodge that bullet in a really meaningful way. So the first thing I want to know for you is why do you start a company in the first place? What's the point of starting a company? To fill a need. To serve, to fill a need, to serve, to provide a solution. Provide a solution to a common problem. To a common problem. Make some money, right? You want to change the world? Change the world. Or make money? Is it hard work? Yeah. It's hard work. You have fun along the way. Is it fun? Sometimes. Sometimes. Who's had a real job before? Was that fun? Yeah. Anybody think it was fun? <laughs> It's not fun, right? So startups are fun. And there's a big payout down the road, right? So what's that payout going to be? How much? Relative to what the is. How much are you going to get? You're doing this, right? How much are you going to get? 5%. 5%. How much money you get? How much does that mean? Oh, billion. Billion dollars. Five, billion, 5 percent is a billion dollars. Is yeah. worth. Are you asking me what do I how much, how much are you going to get? What's your big payout? We're all here because we want a big payout, right? Well, no one has any idea. <laughs> you get a small payout. I'll be your partner. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're talking about today. 32 million. Have you done a financial projection yet? I need 3.2 million in order to retire. Three point two. So your goal is 3.2 million. 32 million. So you, you still don't know what it's going to be, though. We can't predict the future, can we? The future is totally unknowable. No matter how good we are at financial modeling, no matter how good we are guessing, we can't predict the future. Raise your hand if you can predict the future. No one can do it, right? So we don't know what our payout's going to be. So the success criteria then is we're going to change the world for the better, I hope. We're going to make lots of money, some big payout, and you'll get your fair share. That's the success criteria. You'll get your fair share. Everyone said they had a real job before. Who thought they were treated perfectly fairly in that, that real job? Why not? No control over your life, so just didn't a destination? They didn't value your input, maybe? You didn't get paid enough money, maybe, right? People didn't appreciate you for who you were, right? It's not fair. It's not fun. That's what makes it not fun. Do you want your partners to feel that way about you? No. Do you want your partners to feel like you're taking advantage of them? No. Do you want to be taken advantage of? No. Of course not. So if it's fair, it'll be fun. Which brings me to my perfectly fair equity calculation. Your share, the percentage that you should own, should equal the value of your contribution divided by the total value. Does that make sense? Now, what's the problem with this? What's the problem? What's the total value? What's the total value of your company right now? Zero, right? It's worth zero. Absolutely true. It's absolutely true. Who is a company worth more than zero right now? Startup companies are usually worth zero dollars. Until they're worth something by demonstrating revenue growth or traction or customer growth, before they, until they develop some kind of asset, they're worth nothing. And most companies fail and worth nothing. So you can't divide by zero very well. I teach at the University of Chicago, and they some of the best financial minds in the world. They still have not figured out the problem out. You got a Nobel Prize, figure out how to divide by zero. What's the other problem with this? It's one to buy your money. Your contribution. What's your contribution worth? My idea is worth a billion dollars, right? It's worth billions of dollars. Facebook, billions and billions and billions. We can't quantify these things. 
So what we do is we try to estimate the value. We do, we follow a rule of thumb. You find, do financial projections. Look at industry standards. Talk to lawyers, advisors, professors, girlfriends, boyfriends, moms, and dads. What should I do? What should I do? Asking these questions all the time. How much is, what's typical for a CTO in Seattle? How much is a first-time employee get? All these questions that we're just guessing and guessing and guessing and guessing, right? And what we do is we come up with what's called a fixed equity split. 67% of companies split equity at the outset of the venture. A fixed equity split is when chunks of equity are doled out in advance of any work actually being done, used in the beginning. So we'll go in 50-50, right? It's called a fixed equity split. It's a static chunk of equity. It's usually expressed in a percentage. And so our worry, John, you mentioned this earlier to me, I worry that so I give 10%, 35%, these percentages fly around. And what do they have to add up to? 100%. So every time you give away a chunk, what happens to your chunk? It's, by definition, it goes down, right? 60, 40, 50, some people want to maintain the illusion of control. In fact, unless you own 51% of your company, your equity doesn't really matter at all. Why doesn't equity matter at all at this point? It's not worth anything, right? It's worth zero. There's no, there's no profits coming in. You're not, no one's buying you. So equity is a worthless thing unless you're, unless you're using it to maintain control of your company. Maybe we'll do an odd, odd split. So we'll do a third, a third, a third, because it seems more fair. 25, 25, 25. Or 50, 50. One of the most common splits is 50, 50. Anybody done that already? 50, 50? Congratulations. <laughs> so, but what if you do all the work? Or 50-50, you do all the work. Or if you bring in another person. So we're partners. We want to bring in a technology person. You're a technology person. Should it come out of your share or my share? I thought you can help you, right? Not me. Or if you want to quit or your partner wants to quit, is he going to keep a share or is she going to keep her share? What if your CTO gets hit by a bus? Has anyone been hit by a bus before? It hurts a lot. In fact, I met a guy whose CTO was hit by a bus and he subsequently died of his injuries. But his wife inherited his half of the company. And the CTO came to me and said, she's not a CTO, she doesn't know anything about CTOing, but she has half my company. Does that mean I have to give her half the profits forever? And the answer is yes, you do. But she had to hire a new person. She didn't want to give up her share. I don't blame her, right? That was her husband who died. But he's stuck, his company's stuck. He has half his profits going to someone who cannot contribute to the company. And they had, a long, they had some good traction, they had a long way to go. There's a million things that can go wrong. The only thing that never changes about a startup company is the fact that they always change. Wherever you started is not where you think, you, wherever you think you're going to end up is not where you're actually going to end up. Day to day things change, right? You pivot, you change, you adapt, your, your time commitments change, your, your excitement, your branching, things change all the time. You never can predict the future. And there's a million things that could change. So when something changes after your fixed split, one of these things will be true. The first one is that you'll have more than your fair share. Your, your share will be greater than the value of your contribution. Who's comfortable having more than their fair share? Keep your hands up. Who wants to work with these people? <laughs> but I get it. That's very common. There's always a handful of folks like, yeah, if it's going to go south, might as well go south in my favor. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> but immediately, when you realize that someone's taking advantage of you, you don't want to work with that person, right? Because what happens to the startup company? It's not fun anymore, is it? Someone's there taking advantage of me. Because no one wants this less than your fair share. Who wants less than their fair share? Who feels like they're always treated by like they get less than their fair share? So how much of your share, what share do you want? You want exactly the right fair share. Because equal share is 50-50. If you're doing all the work, it's no fun if it's not equal. So you want exactly what you deserve. You, want what you deserve no more, no less, right? You don't want an ambiguous answer either. You want an exact answer. That's what we're going to talk about today. So I call these alligator pit negotiations. There's the less than gator and the greater than gator. Who's been in an alligator pit before? In the alligator pit. Have you? Can you imagine what it's like to be in an alligator pit? I have. How was it like? Was it fun? It was terrifying. Terrifying. What was your instinct? Uh, get the hell out of there. Get the hell out of there as fast as your self-preservation. Get out as fast as throw them some chicken. Where did you asked me that. I was just there two weeks ago and I'm going to leave with alligators. In the alligator pit. <laughs> throwing, <laughs> what were you doing in an alligator pit? Very strange. I know. I know. I just. <laughs> That feeling you experience, that's exactly like an equity negotiation. Yeah. An alligator pit is an equity, so you want to get out of there as fast as possible, get in, so whatever, 50-50, to jump out. It's a painful experience, right? But every time something changes, you've got to go back into the alligator pit and renegotiate and renegotiate and renegotiate. Who's negotiated with a partner on this subject before? Who's negotiated equity splits before? 
Does it feel like that? Yeah. It's very uncomfortable. Because we know that when we come out of there, we're going to be in a less than gator or a greater than gator. And if it's not fair, it won't be fun. I experienced this problem many times in my career, too many times. I've been on both sides of the equation where I've had more than I deserved, and I've been in the equation where I have less than I deserve. And in both cases, I felt bad about it. I felt worse having less than I deserved. So a few years ago, I sat down and wrote a list of criteria where we needed to solve this problem. We needed a pro to have a model that was perfectly fair, not kind of fair or sort of fair or feels fair, actually fair. I want to reward actual contributions when people say they're going to do. Because if you think about it, the founder thinks things are going to be really successful. The dreams of the founder are really high and lofty, right? And then you make me promises of what you're going to do to contribute to that success. So my equity calculation is your promises divided by my dreams. A lot of ambiguity there, right? But I want to reward actual things that people actually do because things change. I want to provide ongoing motivation. If I give you 5% of my company, you might be gung-ho, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed right out of the gates. But once you realize it's not very much, you start being less and less motivated, right? I want to accommodate team changes. People come and go. I want to be flexible in the face of rapid change. I don't want to call my attorney every single time and renegotiate my split and figure it out over and over again. I want to be able to add and subtract people very quickly. And I want to get rid of the gators. I never want anyone to think for a moment that I'm trying to take advantage of them or they're trying to take advantage of me. That's the criteria. So the solution is called a dynamic equity split. A dynamic equity split is one that changes over time. It adjusts as things change in your company. It adjusts, automatically adjusts with your company. Keep it fair. It'll always keep it fair. So if you contributed half what it took to get there, you should get half of the rewards. If you contribute 23.256, you should get 23.256. You should always have no more and no less. You always should get what you deserve. A person's percent share of the rewards should always equal the person's percent share of votes at risk. What are the rewards of a startup company? What are the financial rewards of a startup company? Share of profits on the profits and share of sales on the business. Bingo. Money. Share of the profits when they get the dividends that are paid out to shareholders or the sale price when the company sells. Those are big benefits, right? That's why you're doing this. Most of us are doing it because they want to either sell a company someday or make profits. And your percentage of those rewards should equal your percentages of what it took to get there, right? Here's what I mean. Who knows how to play blackjack? Who knows how to play blackjack? Let's play blackjack, all right? We're going to go to Las Vegas and play blackjack when we're going 50-50. Want to shake on it? 50-50, right? Yeah. Everyone saw that handshake. <laughs> Legal contract. Witnesses made present. Now, we're going to each bet a dollar on it. We're going to go to Vegas with each bet a dollar. So there's your dollar, there's my dollar, there's your dollar. We're playing on the same hand of blackjack as a part, as a team, not against each other, not against each other. All right? Everyone with me still? We don't know if we're going to win, do we? We don't know how much we're going to win. We don't know how long it's going to take to win. The future is totally unknowable. But let's play anyway, right? So, deal or deals. Boom, ace. Another ace. Awesome. What do we do? Split them. All right. Split the aces. But now what do we have to do with the money? We've got to double down, right? Let's double down. You got $2? Sure. Sure, great, because I don't. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So you put two more dollars down. Now you've bet $3, and I've bet a dollar. Does 50 50 sound fair anymore? No. But we had a deal. I could sue you and probably win, right? Does that make it fair? You signed the deal. You shook my hand. You went in with your, you're not on drugs right now, are you? Not that I can So you're of sound mind and body. You made a deal. Is it fair just because I made a deal? No. No, right? Just because it's legal, just because she signed it, just because she agreed to it, doesn't make it fair. What's fair is how much should she get? 75%. That is an unambiguous answer. We still don't know if we're going to win. We don't know how much we're going to win or how long it's going to take to win. What we can absolutely concretely, automatically know is what bets are on the table. Startups are exactly the same thing. In fact, the odds of success in a startup over a five-year period is very similar to the odds of success in a hand of blackjack. It's much more like a gamble than anything else. When you contribute to a startup and you're not compensated, whether it be time or ideas or facilities or supplies or equipment or relationships, whatever you put in, you are betting on the future rewards of that company. And the amount that you're betting is equal to the fair market value of the contribution. It's never worth more. It's never worth less. 
Just because I have an idea and I put it in a startup doesn't magically make it somehow mystically more important than any other idea. Just because I spent two hours working, those two hours aren't magically worth more than your two hours, necessarily, relatively speaking. So we think about startups as a, as a bet, as a gamble. It's clear that we should count the bets, not the future outcome, we can't tell. So, so here's our typical revenue review. So the revenue over time. We start investing in a company. We start spending time and money and ideas. We're, we're investing, we're not getting paid, we're not getting paid, we're not getting paid. And then we start generating revenues, right? We start paying some of our expenses, start paying some of our salaries, start paying for our rent, start paying for stuff, and eventually we break even. At that point, our expenses exceed our costs. And this is profit. This is unknowable. This is easily observable and totally knowable. So at break even, we'll know exactly what our answer was. You're always risking the fair market value of your contribution. Make sense? So if I'm a nobody versus a PhD, MD in astrophysics, that person's probably going to have a higher market salary worth, worth to me in, the same, in, the, in that context. If we're flipping burgers, it's different. How much does a doctor get paid? How much do you get paid? Nothing. <laughs> How much could you get paid if you got a real job? Whatever you negotiate, that's your fair market value. So the model is called a grunt fund. There's two pieces of it. There's an allocation framework, which will determine the allocation of equity in that startup company. The second piece is called a recovery framework, which determines the recovery, how to get shares back when someone flakes out or quits or leaves. Because when someone leaves, you want to get it back. What's the, what happens if you don't get it back? They're profiting off of your work. If Poten profitable. Potentially, right? Now, that may, might be OK. But you also may have some absentee owner that doesn't like you that can cause all kinds of problems. So we want to protect the future of the company by getting equity back. So here's how it works. The first thing you do is you convert your contributions to slices. A slice is a fictional unit of at-risk contribution. It's like a poker chip. It's a pretend thing that I made up to help, keep us, help us keep track. Convert to slices. Everything can convert to slices. Then your share at break even or series A, I'll tell you more about that, is equal to the number of slices you contributed over all the slices. Just like your three dollars divided by four dollars, my one dollar divided by four dollars, and you're allowed to self-adjust over time, which is why it's called dynamic. So every day that goes by, you're investing more time, more money, more ideas, more rent, more facilities. Every every day that goes by, and I don't know when you're going to raise Series A. Who's raising Series A? Anyone raising money right now? There's no way of telling when it's actually going to come in. When I started one of my companies a few years ago, I promised my wife I'll have money raised by February, and I did the following February. Took me a year longer than I thought. So all that time that went by between the February that I thought I was going to raise money and the February that I actually raised money, I was continuing to, continue to burn my own money. And people have been burning their own time. So that, that, over time, you never know when it's going to stop. So there's two types of contributions. There's a non-cash contribution, the things like time and ideas and facilities and relationships. And there are cash contributions, which is cash consumed by the company. Now, there's a difference between cash and non-cash. If I paid you $100 an hour to work for me, and you want to buy this mug that costs $100, how long would it take you to earn enough money to buy that mug? It's a trick question. Yeah. So thank you for your answer. 100. 100 hours? Yeah. Not quite. Uh, no, I'm saying one hour. One hour. That makes sense? But when I pay you, I had to pay employment taxes and social security taxes. When you receive the money, you pay income taxes. And when you buy that thing, you pay sales tax or VAT tax, right? So it may take you two hours to earn enough money to buy that one thing. Now, as an investor, do I want you to be happy-go-lucky with my money, or do I want you to be careful with my money? So I want you to be careful with my money. So I have to put something in place to accommodate the fact that cash has a different kind of value than non-cash. Who has more time than money? Most people do. Who has more money than time? Some, some investors. Can you name one? What? Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett has more money than he has time. He sees a Rolex on the ground. It's not worth his time to pick it up. He's got to be like, oh, look, there's a Rolex. Oh, there's a Rolex here, too. <laughs> Call somebody. I saw a Rolex back there. You can hire someone to pick the Rolex books for him. It's not worth his time, right? We're not in that boat. If we were, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. We'd just pay for everything. In fact, if I pay for all my expenses, 
and I pay for everything, I get all the equity. It's just logical. You want to keep the equity, just pay for everything. But you can't. You don't have the money, you got to use something else. So we apply a normalizer. We take the fair market value of these contributions, which I'll show you how to calculate in a minute. We apply a normalizer. 2x for non-cash and 4x for cash. No. It's based on the fact that worldwide, the worldwide tax rate is about 50%, so cash is worth roughly twice that. And this is based, we have to carry some, some teeth. Now, when I, when I invest in a company, I'm taking a great deal of risk, right? I told you before, the chance of winning a blackjack hand are similar to winning a, a startup hand over five years. Blackjack plays two to one. So two allows us to provide the, the accommodation for a similar level of risk. And four allows us to accommodate the fact that cash has a higher value in terms of taxes and things like that. I mean, there's all kinds of things you want, you want to align the investors. So if I give you $1,000, I don't want you to spend it. I want you to think twice before you spend it. Were you talking about fair market value in terms of salary? Or yes, okay. salary. So that's a good question. Fair market salary. All of us have a fair market salary. Someone right out of college, maybe worth $30,000. A PhD astrophysicist, maybe worth $200,000. A startup founder with no budget, no employees, no customers, no responsibilities, isn't worth $300,000 probably. They're probably worth between dollars and $150,000 in, in this part of the world. So you want to think rationally. If I went to pitch an investor and said, hey, I'm worth $400,000, so half your money is going to go to me, they'd probably say no. So you want to set salaries based on the fair market for that particular job. If I hired a PhD astrophysicist to flip burgers for me, how much is it worth? How much it cost to? 10 bucks an hour, right? Burgers. Flipping burgers, right? Yeah. You can do it. I can do it. We can, do, we can train pretty quickly. So just because I, I can't earn that much doesn't mean I, that I should get it. So whatever the job is. You negotiate it just like you do any other job. When you take a job, you just simply negotiate your salary. You've all done this before, right? Sounds good, you take the job, no, you don't take the job. So with the start with the, with the grunt fund, we're negotiating a fair market salary. I subtract cash compensation, because if I pay you, that's not a bet. I multiply it by two and I get my grunt hourly resource rate, or grrr, which is the sound you make when you're working hard in your company. There's roughly 2,000 hours in a year, by the way. So, here's an example. 50 bucks an hour, which is $100,000 a year, times two gives me a grunt hourly resource rate of 100 slices per hour. Every hour that goes by, I'm contributing 100 slices to that pie. Work one hour, 200 slices, two hours, 200 slices, 300 slices. Every hour that goes by is 100 slices to that pie. I want to keep my, keep, track my time in enough granularity to make it meaningful. So I can track it hourly, I can track daily, I can track weekly or monthly, however it makes sense for me and my company. But I want to keep track of how much I'm betting. Because you don't know, some people work part-time. Who, who, who has part-time founders? Sure, right? Who has part-time advisors? Part-time advisors. Who's working full-time? So you're working full-time. So your time commitments vary. As they should. And you should be able to make decisions about your life. If you want to take time off, you should be able to take time off. If we're 50-50 and you take a vacation, I have no choice but to be pissed off at you. Right? Why, do I get a vacation now? I mean, I should go take a vacation. I worked with a company once where I'm, I, had a, I had a baby. I took a week off to spend for the birth of my child. He's all pissed off at me. Take a time off. I should be able to go do that. I should have that choice, right? I'm a big boy. A baby. But because we had a fixed equity split, he had no choice but to be upset with me about that time off. Question for you. Going back to the, I guess the, the, the equation, the fair market salary minus the cash compensation, and then using $50 an hour as an example. Cash compensation. Here's an example. Fifty dollars an hour, and I paid ten bucks an hour to that person, so I'm putting forty dollars at risk, which reduces my slices to eighty slices per hour. So as I get revenue in the door, I can start paying my salaries. Small amounts of money, cash amount times four. What's the small amount of money you contribute to your company lately? Anybody buy a plane ticket lately? Buying plane tickets, expenses, unreimbursed expenses, cash on websites, all kinds of anything you spend cash on. When it's consumed, it's four slices. If it's sitting in the bank, is it at risk? No, it's sitting in the bank, right? Call it the well. 
The well is a holding place for, for, cap, for cash. So you put $1,000 in the well, it just sits there. When I take it out of the well, out of the savings account, to spend it, it converts to cash, converts to slices. When it becomes at risk, it converts to slices. Remember, it's slices are like a poker chip. It sounds like this is a lot of management. No. It does sound like it's a lot of management, because I'm going to see very carefully. But do you track your expenses anyway? Yeah. Do you track your revenue anyway? You track your rent? Like you should be tracking all these things anyway. Right. This is basic accounting. Now, you may not be tracking your time right now, but to layer that on, given the benefits, is pretty straightforward. So one of the initial realities, it's, it's, it's understandable you think that, but the reality, in execution, if you're not paying at least a modicum of attention to your business, you're probably going to fail anyway, so it doesn't matter. Okay. So you, you track your expenses, you track your revenue, you track your rent, you track these things. And you make good decisions about them, I hope. In fact, pretend you have a magical ATM machine, and the ATM machine will spit out cash as long as you make good decisions with the money. So what you do is you make a good decision with the money. If I have the cash, I pay it. If I don't have the cash, I use slices instead. So it allows you to run your company like a real company. I just got to ask you, how much, is this, how much is your services worth? Well, it's worth $1,000. If I want to buy it for $1,000, I'll say, great. I don't have any cash. I'll give you slices. If it's not worth 1000 bucks, I shouldn't buy it. There's no ROI there. Can I go back to that last slide for a second? So, so we might ask why uh, you would see price by doing You'll see in during the recovery framework. Right. When I first invented this, I, I didn't have any multipliers, and it backfired because there's no consequence for leaving the company. And I'll show you how that works in a minute. The, the multipliers are very important. They'll come back during the recovery framework. But I got to reward you. I, gotta, I give you two to one on your, on your non-cash because you're taking a high level of risk. If I treated your cash as if, your non-cash as, as if my equity is worth the same as the money, it's not really worth the same as money. It's, it's a high risk instrument. Okay. Equipment. If I bought it new for the company, it's an unreimbursed expense. Worth same as cash. If it's less than a year old, I owned it. It's a non-cash contribution because I already owned it and put any cash out for it. So it's, I use the purchase price. If it's more than a year old, I look, use the book value. Everything has a fair market value. Relationships. If I have a relationship that's really my big Rolodex, if I can turn it into value, I should get a commission on it, right? If I can turn it into investment, I should get a refiner's fee on it. Everything has a fair market value. If I have an idea, so are you saying with the relationships, until you convert that into an actual note, so to speak, it doesn't have any value yet? Right. right. I might know everybody. Hey, Mike so Moyer knows everybody in the business. Convert. If I can't make any money off it, who cares? So and it's based off, is that based off, uh, it's based off the gross that's, that's earned from that? Whatever's standard unit, whatever, whatever is logical to pay a salesperson or a fundraiser for you. If I have an idea, oh, our idea is worth so much, it's going to be worth billions and billions of dollars. If that idea translates into revenue, you get a royalty on it. The fair market value of an idea is someone either buying the idea from you or giving you a royalty on it. If I write a book or have a great song or invent some technology or some car part, I get a royalty on the idea. Uh, unreimbursed expenses, time store. Uh, I'll make a deal. So here's an example. Here's some grunts hanging out 1871, looking for work. We're going to pick three and start a company, right? We've got our junior developer. She builds websites and some basic and some apps. She's putting her time in. She's a junior developer. We've got the founder who put the idea in, there's some time in, and some equipment in. And we've got the rich uncle who put some cash in and made some important introductions. Make sense? What's the first step? Convert to slices, right? Shazam, there they are. Now we've got slices, we've got a common poker chips on their back. We add them all up. This gives us our total. Each person gets their share. There's number one, two, and three. There's our split. It makes sense that the junior developer has less than the rich uncle who's putting all the cash up. It makes sense the founder, who didn't put the cash up, because cash is worth a lot of money. Has, so this is exactly the right split at this moment in time. If this company were to sell or break even at this point in time, that's the split. Yeah. Doesn't this introduce weird incentives like add your hours and be less efficient than you might be if it wasn't like down to the hour? Or is it more like rough, like you're full time, he's part time? Uh, you found somebody padding your hours, what do you want to do to that person? You want to get rid of them. You want to get rid of them. So you're trying to measure productivity by those hours? I can be dishonest if I want to, but you're, I'm going to get fired for it. And there's a mechanism to protect you against that. So I, I behave the way I should behave. If, I'm, say, if I see Slicey Pie and I want to game it, make it work for myself, you're going to get fired for that. 
just like you would if you're stealing from another company. So I'll show you how that, there's a recovery framework that'll protect you from that. I, I'm a little confused. So if I'm the junior developer, and let's just say I come on board and say, I, I, I can't pay you, but I'm giving you slices. Slices, and that at this current moment equates to 7% of equity, but tomorrow I might get investment and I can start paying the salary. So right. I can take some of the slices back. You're not buying slices back unless you pay them back for lost salary. Okay. I'm just, I'm, I'm just now I'm going to start paying you. So your bet's on the table. It stays on the table, but now we're getting paid going forward. But those slices but it's are... Built right? yeah. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. as it should. Okay. And I'll show you how that works in a minute. Yeah, so I, I just, it, it's a little confusing to incentivize people with that because it's constantly changing yeah. the, the right. value of the slices. What's really confusing is to give them a fixed equity split and realize it was oh, wrong no, I, and I have agree. to unwind it. Yeah. So, but we have different time commitments, and people, people, have, people need to understand that things change over time, and the equity split, dilution is not a bad word. All it means is that it's adjusting for fairness, unless it's not. In a fixed scenario, dilution means I get burned every time somebody comes in the door. In a dynamic scenario, it means I ebb and flow properly in the company. So I think part of it, part of, I think, what we're challenging up and up against is, is really going against the mindset that's been set. Right. right. Perspective. From our culture. The cultural norms on this topic, so conventional thinking is just plain wrong. So if you're trying to enroll somebody or engage someone in helping you build the startup or whatever capacity, and now you have to then come with this, you're, you're bumping up against conventional notion, right. it can be challenging and you may not necessarily get that person to work. Right, there's two reasons. just bumping up against that. So conventional thinking, I'll say this to the camera, conventional thinking on this is just plain flat out wrong. If you're doing the conventional way, the traditional way, it's just wrong. It is a flaw in the collective wisdom of this world. There's two reasons why you wouldn't want to use this model. The first one is I don't get it. I don't get my head around it. In which case, my big challenge is education, which I'm doing today. The second reason is I get it, but I still don't want to use it because I want to take advantage of you. Now, which one do you want to work with? Yeah, so if you find someone who says, I get it, oh, I get it, I get it, I don't know how it works, but I don't want to do it because it's easier to do 50-50. That person wants to take advantage of you. His or her intentions may not be sinister, but that's basically what it means. It's also more stagnated, right? Because I would say it's more dynamic, even like project management. It's agile nowadays, right? So I think adapt on the goal. Right. It allows you because so you, you just don't know what's going to happen. My pivot might change. Bring, let's bring in somebody new. So look at this. Let's bring in a sales guy. This guy's name is Barry. He's got a big Rolodex. He said, come on board. And let's pretend for a moment no one else has any time. He, he put some time and made some sales, right? That's a good thing. What do we do with his stuff? Convert to slices, right? Using the, using the multipliers. We add his stuff into the base, and then we recalculate everybody. There's number one, two, three, and four. Now our pie looks like this. Now, here's our salesperson. Now, the uncle's got a little bit less. Is he okay with that? We just made sales. The pie's bigger. Things are going forward. That's great. I diluted appropriately because I got another asset that came in building the company. If I hung on for dear life to my 66% or whatever it was, the bear is not going to want to come on board. The bear's like, hell of you. And that happens all the time. This guy says, oh, no, I want a non dilutable. Anybody says the word non dilutable share to you is, is insane. But that's the allocation framework. You track your contributions, convert to slices, and determine your split. Now, when someone leaves the company, you might want to get some back. There are four reasons why someone can leave the company. You can be fired for good reason. What's being fired for good reason? Not doing your job, padding your hours, stealing from the company, sexual harassment, right? If it's, if it's performance related, it's, it's warning, warning, fired. If you don't give someone a warning, it's not fair to fire them. If you fire them without warning, it's called fired for no good reason. Fired for no good reason is I can fire you for whatever the hell I want to. You're fired. That sucks, but you're fired, right? Ah, darn, you fired me, that's no fair. I'm sorry, you're fired. I can resign for good reason, too. What would we be resigning for good reason? Retirement. What? Retirement. It's a good reason for you. Would you say? Better opportunity. It's a good reason for you, yeah. but not a good reason for the company. If the company changed my job, it's not what I signed up for. That's, that's different. If they changed my compensation, it's not what I signed up for. So the good reason for you is that the good reason for the company is that the company changes the game on you. Let's say, hey, we're, we're in Chicago based. We're moving to Seattle. Pack your bags. Get your kids out of school. Moving to Seattle. That's a good reason for you to resign. The company did something that's a negative impact on your life. Or you can resign for no good reason. 
I got a better job somewhere else. I'm retiring. I don't believe in the future of the company. I can't work for, afford to work for free anymore. That's no good reason. This means you're leaving the company in the lurch. In these two situations, A and D, the employee has made decisions about how they're going to behave as a potentially negative impact on the future of the company. There should be consequences for that. In these two scenarios, the company has made decisions that negatively impact the future of the employee. The, the employee deserves protection against that, right? It's not fair. You can't just fire me and take my equity back. So, if you're fired for good reason or you're resigned for no good reason, you lose your pie for non-cash contributions. You walk away from your bets in cash. That's where that 2x multiplier has some teeth. You also lose your multiplier for the cash contributions. So I'll pay your cash back. I can't steal your money. You put 1000 bucks in, I'll give you 1000 bucks back. We par friends. It hurts to leave under those circumstances, as it should. If you don't want to lose your slices, don't quit. Don't get fired. Do your job. That's the reason. Right. So, if I'm resigned for good reason or fired for no good reason, I get to keep my slices. And the buyback price starts at a dollar per slice. So if I put $10,000 worth of my time in, you've got to pay me $20,000 to get rid of me. I worked with a woman not long ago who has had a fair market salary of $60,000 $60, a year, $5,000 a month. She worked for two months. She accrued 20,000 slices. Right? You guys with me still? She got in a fight with her boss who fired her on the spot. That was residential. There was, there was no good reason, right? He didn't give her a warning. Now, the buyout price starts at $20,000. He didn't want to give her $20,000. She was an infected employee. I don't blame him. But he should have thought twice before he fired her for no good reason. He should have given her a warning. Don't do that behavior. And she gets the opportunity to correct her behavior. If she corrects her behavior, great. If she doesn't correct her behavior, she gets another warning. And the third time she's out. So if this guy wanted to not give her slices, he should have given her an opportunity to correct her, correct her behavior. Does this also happen when uh, you're post-revenue? It's whatever your policies are. When you're post-revenue, the rules change. And the, the investor comes in and makes new rules. Slicing by works until break even. So here's an example. Here's our grunts hard at work. Junior developer slacking on the job. Let's give her a warning. Warning, don't slack on the job. Warning number one. Warning number two, a week later goes by, she's still not showing up at work. Warning number two, warning number three, what happens? Boom, fired. So she just put in time, non-cash contributions. So her stuff just goes away. We recalculate everyone's shares. There's number two, three, and four. An hour pile looks like this, she's gone. And the uncle has a little bit more than he did before. Is he happy? They kind of have to hire a new developer. They kind of have a setback. It's not that great. She has damaged the company, but they've recovered her slices, and they can go out and hire somebody new. So the recovery framework puts in a set of logical fail, fair rules and consequences for the at-fault party in the, in the separation to make sure that people's needs are aligned. So eventually, you want to bake the pie. Bing. When you bake the pie, it stops accruing slices, and it becomes a regular fixed split. When you do it, boom. Well, you can just pay people. So when you generate enough revenue to pay people, the slices no longer accrue. When you have Series A investment, you can just pay people, the slices no longer accrue. So here's an example. So let's say I'm, your fair market salary is $50 an hour, and I pay you nothing. That translates into 100 slices per hour. Now we're generating revenue. I can pay you 10 bucks an hour. Can't pay your whole thing, but can pay you 10 bucks an hour. So now, going forward, you're only accruing 80 slices per, 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 per hour. Now we get more revenue, boom, I can pay you more money, changes it again, more money, changes it again, more money, until I pay you 100% of your salary, now you're accruing zero slices per hour. I'm paying my rent, I'm paying my employees, I'm paying my stuff, I'm paying my commissions, I'm paying my electrical bill, my websites, all this. I'm paying for everything out of revenues. I've broken even, what happens now? What happens? The pie bakes, and I get profits, right? Now, what do I do with those profits? Boom. The pie determines the distribution of dividends when they come in, if they're paid out, or the proceeds of the sale. I'm not paying you back. 
when you put your $3 on the table, the casino doesn't give you your money back, does it? They give you your winnings, but then like, well, here's your winnings plus your bet back. They don't give you your bet back. The bet's the bet. So this is the bet paying off. She bet 75%, I bet 25%, we split the money in 25, 75, if we win. So if she spent 100 hours working on this, that was her bet. That was her bet. And, and let's say that wiped out her savings. She's not getting that repaid. She just needs to start building things back up. Right. Probably hopefully, her, hopefully her future dividends and proceeds would exceed what she bet. Now you bring up an interesting point. What if she wipes her savings out and I didn't? What if her $3 was nothing to her? My dollar was everything I had. Does that matter? No. My risk tolerance may be different. My actual risk is relative to hers is the same. Is that basically like vesting, what you were just referring to? Like slicing, in the system? slicing pie is vesting. Can be used as vesting instead of time-based vesting. Time-based time vesting is, is, a, is a tool for mitigating the damage done by a fixed equity split. So I'm going to give you a fixed chunk of equity. It's wrong because I don't know what you're going to do. So just in case you flake out in six months or a year or whatever, I'm going to have some kind of tool to get it back. But there's nothing stopping me from firing you the day before you vest. I've seen that happen in real life. There's nothing stopping you from quitting the day after you vest. I've seen that happen in real life. So vesting is a flawed tool. Slicing pie vesting, on the other hand, at break even, you'll all vest exactly what you deserve to vest. Are there good sources for contracts that would have those clauses? That would... It's got two thumbs. It's right in front of you. Good sources. <laughs> There's contracts online. Okay. Definitely good sources. All over the world, I've got sources for you. So here's how a Series A investment would work. Let's say you negotiate a $900,000 pre-money valuation and you raise a million dollars. What's the post-money valuation then? 1.9, right? How much have I sold? I sold 1.9 valuation. I've sold 53% of the equity. So everyone else dilutes appropriately in this model. And I use that money to pay my salary, to pay my employees, pay my rent, pay my stuff. So now when the profits or sale comes in, I had to split it with this person. So she gets her investment back. Or her, she gets her series, series A. Now, whatever terms she wants to apply on the rest of the team, she, they all apply equally. So, what I've just shown you, what you just witnessed, is a perfectly fair model, an unambiguously perfectly fair. Now, I know you might still have questions running around your head. When, you get your, when it clicks for you, you'll realize this is a perfectly fair model. I'm rewarding actual contributions, people think things people actually have done for the company, not, think, well, not that what they promised they're going to do, or we hope they're going to do, or we think they're going to do, what they've actually done. Ongoing motivation, I know what my consequences are if I leave or flake out or don't work. I've accommodated team changes. At no point during this presentation did I stop and call my lawyer, did I? We had and subtracted someone. I didn't have to call, it was a rapid change, no lawyers. And no one for a second thought I was taking advantage of them. Make sense? So you asked about legal resources. So there's lots of resources, I want to give you a little look at them. Um, this is book Slicing Pie, which is very popular. Um, this book has been rewritten. It's called the Slicing Pie Handbook now. So buy that one if you want to buy it. If you, send me, if you can't afford to buy it, send me an email. I'll send it to you. Um, it's been translated in lots of different languages. New languages are online all the time. Uh, there's a European Union version. Anybody starting in Europe? I'm doing differences. This is for the Netherlands, for instance. There's an attorney in the Netherlands. Why is there a difference? Because there's different laws, different tax laws. Oh, okay. So different structural laws. So the, the, the model is universal. How it's implemented varies from country to country. Um, so does it matter in the US if you're a secret or an LLC? It doesn't, but there's way different, it matters how you handle it tax-wise. So for instance, in an LLC, you do capital calls periodically. That would readjust the equity splits. You could do buy-downs. So you'd buy down shares to equal, the, to equal slice of pie. In a C Corp, you would issue restricted shares in the beginning, a fixed number of restricted shares, and you file an 83B election and use slicing by as a vesting tool. So there's different legal structures how you can do it. Some people write their, deal, their terms into the operating agreements. Some people use a separate agreement. So all kinds of different ways. If your lawyer says, this will never work, have them call me. If your lawyer tries to talk you out of it, have them call me. I'll spend as much time as it takes to get the lawyer up to speed. I do it all the time. Yep. There's also software that manages the split for you. You can add your, add your grunts and add your time, your salaries, and manage all those splits for you. Um, there's lots of resources. There's, uh, you can set up a phone call with me. There's bonus content. There's all kinds of stuff online. Legal contracts, set up a call with me. Just click right here. Set up a call with me. Again, if you can't afford it, let me know, and I'll set up, set up some time with you. 
My job in my life right now is to make sure that every startup in the, in the world gets what they deserve out of their company. My biggest challenge is education, but this, this model is growing more rapidly every day. And I promise you, if you start a company, you should definitely consider this model. If you don't, it's going to backfire, in spite of your best intentions. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Thank Have you. a nice life. Thank you.